Well, welcome to tonight's uh, presentation. My name is Richard Ader, uh, director of the Fundamental School. I'll be subbing for Mike Kopkis tonight. And before we get underway with tonight's presentation, uh, just a few announcements. Clubhouse hours, uh, the clubhouse is going to be open for all scheduled classes. Uh, these will be live in-person events, but will also be live streamed as well as recorded and available to be viewed 24-7 by all students registered for the class. Now at this time, the clubhouse will be open for all scheduled competitions. These will be live in-person events, but will also be live streamed, recorded, and available on YouTube. And unless otherwise noted, we will not be opening up the clubhouse for any Zoom presentations scheduled in January and February. They will be conducted from home and links to attend the Zoom presentation will be sent out on the Wednesday before the presentation. And as of now, these are all members only presentations. They will also be recorded for future viewing by club members, but will not be available on YouTube. To reiterate again, our COVID considerations at this point in time, now all persons attending the Friday meetings in person through the end of February are required to wear a mask at all times while in the building, no matter what their vaccination status. As for our classes, we are requiring all students and helpers who attend live classes to wear a mask at all times while they are in the building, no matter what their vaccination status. And we strongly encourage all non-vaccinated members and students to attend meetings and classes virtually for the time being. Now, some upcoming competitions, February 25th, is our photojournalism competition. The deadline for entry is uh, February 22nd. March 4th, we'll have a creative competition with the deadline being February 23rd. March 11th, it'll be our B competition with the deadline will be March 2nd. And photojournalism, again, is on March 25th with a deadline of March 23rd. And to reiterate, all of these except the B competition, competition for the rest of the year are digital. For upcoming speakers, March 18th, we're gonna have a members only Zoom presentation. Peter Baumgarten, uh, shoot for the stars, the clubhouse will not be open. On April 8th, we'll have a members only Zoom presentation. Lisa Kuchara doing light painting the clubhouse will not be open. And at the request of our speaker for that one, this presentation will not uh, be recorded. Registration for the spring classes is open. Fundamentals, Fundamentals of Photography is going to be starting Saturdays, April 9th and run through May 14th. Photoshop editing will be on Wednesdays, April 6th through June 8th. And Lightroom will be on Mondays, March 21st through April 25th. And you can also, as a reminder, watch this and many Friday evening meetings at your convenience on the CPS YouTube channel. Now, the link is on the CPS website homepage or open YouTube and search for Cleveland Photographic. And we would invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and choose to be notified whenever a new video is posted. So without any further ado, at this time, I will introduce John Theobald. John. Is the sound okay? Is that good? You can hear me okay. Uh, thank you for coming. Not a lot of pretty pictures. Observing our world through street photography and trying to capture decisive, unusual, or often overlooked moments. My name is John Theobald. I'm a former public school teacher. I'm an avid traveler. I've been to 119 countries and 49 of the 50 states. I've been a member of CPS for nine years, and I have a passion for street photography. Uh, all the photographs you're gonna see this evening were taken by me. All were, uh, all except for a few at the very beginning are completely candid and unstaged. Nothing is set up for most of these pictures except for a few at the beginning. And please keep in mind, 
I am a traveler. Many of these photographs were taken while I traveled, but you don't have to travel necessarily that far for street photography. Cleveland and the Cleveland area, northern Ohio, are actually great places to do street photography. Uh, I would ask you please to hold any questions or comments till the very end, and I'd be happy to take those. And also, please keep in mind, I'm talking in general terms. Uh, street photography as a genre is not necessarily carved in stone, and it's open, into, uh, open up for interpretation, and I'm giving you my interpretation of it. I'm going to start the pre uh, presentation in just a second. This is just the premiere. I'm going to start the presentation with the definition, what is street photography? I could ask five different street photographers what it is, and they could give me five separate answers. So what I've done is taken from my own experience. I've been doing this about six years from many books I've read on the subject, many videos I've seen, and other sources, and I've come up with this definition. Street photography is candid, unstaged, unmanipulated, and very often spontaneous photography that tries to capture contemporary life, the human condition, various interactions, relationships, and emotions. It can sometimes tell part of a story or create a mystery for the viewer. It is usually taken in public places. Now, to clarify this definition, I'm going to look at those first four terms. And the first term is candid. The photographs you're looking at right now are not candid photographs. Each of these photographs were taken of strangers, and I went up and asked them for the photo. So if you ask someone for a photo, it is not candid, therefore it's not street photography. This type of photography is called street portraiture. And most people, if you ask them on the street, they'll let you take their picture. Now, candid does not necessarily mean the person is totally unaware you're about to take their picture, uh, because people often are. People aren't stupid or blind. They can see when you point a camera at them. And so for the next couple pictures, they are street photos, but they are not, and they are candid, but the people were very aware that I took their shot. This man was on a donkey cart riding by when I took his picture, and obviously he saw my camera, smiled for me. I was in the uh, Dalai Lama's temple in Tibet when I took this photo. I was a floor above a stairway looking down at the mostly female monks. There were a few children on the stairs too. And originally I wanted a photo of the colorful clothing and the uh, shaved heads of the, the, uh, the women. Suddenly this young man throws his head and shoulders back onto the arm of one of the women, looks up, and that's when I captured the shot. So it's candid, but he was aware I took a shot. This Ukrainian woman was running down the street, probably late to a wedding which was being held nearby. She didn't stop for a picture, but she certainly knew I took a picture as she ran by. And this running horde of students were headed toward their, uh, their school buses. They were probably late uh, coming back from a, uh, a field trip. They were running down the street. All I had to do was pick up my camera, point it at them, and they got this, uh, I got this photo. Now, most of the time as a street photographer, we don't want people to ever be aware before, during, or after that we're taking their photograph. And for these shots you're seeing, the people never knew I took their shot. You try to be as discreet, as quick and quiet as possible. Try to capture their facial expression before it changes, before they see you. Um, you want to capture their body language and what they're doing.
Now, I think a lot of people are afraid that they'll be caught taking some stranger's picture. And what happens when you're caught in the act? I was in Calcutta, India. It was a very hot day, and I'm standing underneath a tree next to a very large man-made pond. And in and around that pond were a dozen or so Indians who were either swimming, some were doing their laundry, other activities. And I saw one man dive under the water. He's swimming under the water, and he's heading in my direction. So I thought maybe it'd be great to get a picture of him as he comes up out of the water. And I did. He came up only a few feet away from me. And that's the shot I got. Now, imagine you opening your eyes and seeing someone pointing a camera right at you. He was a little surprised. He was maybe a little unhappy, and he kind of looks angry. And you can just imagine what happened next. He very quickly got out of the pond, came over to me, grabbed my camera, and threw it to the ground. Then he punched me in the stomach and walked away muttering something in Hindi. And as I said, you can imagine that happening, but that's all it would be, your imagination. Nothing like that happened. Nothing like that ever happened to me, and I hope it never will. I'm not guaranteeing it won't, but, you know, what I'm trying to say is don't be afraid of taking pictures of strangers. Uh, this is not the only picture I took of them. I actually took three shots, because when I'm taking a picture of someone who's moving or an object that's moving, I often take more than one shot. So this is the first shot, the one I like the best. And if you look at his chin, you see a little water droplet. Watch that water droplet in the next three pictures just to show you how quickly I took these in succession. So first picture. Second picture. Third picture. He doesn't look like he's going to beat me up anymore, does he? No. Uh, after taking this picture, I simply lowered my camera. I waved to him, said thank you. He waved back, turned around, swam away. Often when you take pictures of people and they catch you in the act, they just smile at you. They don't have a problem with you. Uh, they're sometimes even flattered you took their picture. Sometimes when you take pictures of people, they just ignore you. I know they know I took their photograph because maybe we made eye contact. But generally, they just ignore you. They're too busy doing something else, going about their business. Occasionally, someone will actually, actually look behind them because they're not sure you took their picture. Or maybe you were taking a picture of someone behind them or something behind them. So they look to see what you were taking a picture of. And once in a while, someone will actually approach you, but not to beat you up or yell at you or swear at you. They want to see the photograph. So you show them the photo on the back of your camera, and then if they want it, a copy of it, or you can always ask if they want a copy, you reach in your pocket, give them your email address and your name, and then tell them, please email me. Uh, make sure in the email you include where you were, what you were doing, maybe what you look like or what you were wearing, and then I promise when I get back from my trip, I'll send you an email copy of the photograph. 80% of the time, you'll never hear from the person. They lost interest or they lost your card. 20% of the time, you will hear from them, and when you do, you send them the photo and they're usually very appreciative. So don't be afraid of taking pictures of strangers and being caught. Not facing it. If you went to a lecture on people photography or went to a competition where they were taking pictures of people, you may hear something like, well, you know, when you take a picture of a person, you have to have the front of them, their face, and especially the eyes, because the eyes are the windows of the soul. But that's not necessarily true for street photography. In this next picture, I, I took this in a parade in Cleveland. I didn't get the picture of the eyes of the clown. But it's not about the eyes, it's about the color and the texture. This next photo, I'd never enter into a competition because I know the judge would say, oh, the kid should have been looking at you, or we should at least see the pupils of the eyes. But it's not about his face or his eyes, it's about what he's doing with his arms. Sometimes I take the backs of people's heads in my photographs. And if you're shy about taking pictures of people, this is one way you can approach taking pictures of people. This was taken a couple years before COVID. And that was a woman who was walking across the street in front of me. Sometimes I take the whole body of a person, but again, not necessarily from the front. 
If this man had been walking toward me in the picture, it wouldn't have made as much sense. Couple more back shots. Sometimes they take the limbs of people, their feet and legs, their arms and hands. Again, if you're nervous about taking pictures of people on the street, this is one way to approach it. They won't think you're taking their picture as long as you don't uh, point it towards the camera towards their face. This was taken from a balcony above. And at one point, I started to take pictures of people's hands behind their backs. What I do is approach them about three or four feet away from the back, stoop down quickly, get a quick shot, and then I walk away. And I think some of these hand shots can say almost as much about a person if I had taken, as if I had taken a picture of their face. The next term is unstaged, and I'd, I don't have any specific photos to show you while I'm talking about unstaged because all the photographs you're seeing this evening, with the exception of a couple of those portraits you've already seen, are completely unstaged. They're unset up, and they're not pre-planned. I just take the shot as I see it. You know, you can do anything with your mind. You can be as um, decisive or creative as you want. You can do anything with your body. You can move closer, further away, go to the left or the right. Uh, you can do anything with your camera. You can put it on any setting, or use any kind of camera, any kind of lens. But where that lens ends is where your uh, control ends. You can't pick up litter in front of you to take the picture. You can't ask anyone to be in a picture or to leave a picture. And if a dog wanders into your picture, you can't shoo it away. So take the picture as found as is. Next term is unmanipulated. And here we're talking about what you do in the dark room if you use film or in Photoshop. And I only do digital, uh, digital shots. If there are any rules in street photography, they'd be the same as in photojournalism. A photojournalist's job is to take an image and then keep the truth, the reality, the veracity of that image in its final product. So as a street photographer, there's very little you can do in post-production. You can sharpen it, contrast it, up or down, you can lighten it, darken it, but just a little bit. You can't do too much. You can never clone anything in or anything out with a couple exceptions. So if I take a picture of four people and all of them have hats on except for one guy, I can't put a hat through cloning on that guy's head. If I take a picture and I look at my computer screen, I notice oh, there are a lot of cigarette butts on the ground or maybe someone has a tree growing out of their head or something like uh, maybe there's a woman in the background who has a very bright red um, dress on. I can't clone any of that out. They stay in the picture. Uh, you can clone out a couple things, though. If you get sensor dust on your sensor and that shows up on the picture, you can always take that out. If you're shooting in the rain or snow or dusty conditions, you can always remove those little particles or, or water droplets. And if you get an occasional little white speck or dark speck and it, you want to get rid of that, you probably can do that too. But you really can't clone anything uh, larger than a speck out. I only shoot in color, but a lot of the pictures that you've seen have been in black and white because I often convert them. Uh, when I see a color picture, I look at it and if the color is important or if it doesn't matter if it's in color or black and white, often it stays in color. But sometimes color is very disruptive. Sometimes it will uh, look much better in black and white. And also, that woman in the red dress I couldn't clone out before, I can convert that picture to black and white, and now you don't notice her dress as much. Can you crop in street photography? There are two schools of thought. There are the purists who say you should never, ever crop, and the purists will say, 
oh no, you must take it in the camera and you must always keep that original proportion, same composition, everything stays as you took it in the camera. But I'm not a purist. I believe if you can improve on a picture, you certainly can crop it. Um, I also often take a picture and before I've even list, lifted my camera up to my eye, I know I'm gonna be cropping ahead of time because I see a subject or a scene or something and I know it's gonna look good as a square or maybe as a, a panoramic shot, but my camera only takes a rectangular shot. And by the way, I also wanna add that you should always uh, compose and crop best in camera as you take the shot, but that's not always possible in street photography, which leads us to this picture. I was in Hong Kong when I took this picture, and it looks like I actually took three shots that I put together in uh, Photoshop, but it's actually one whole shot. Well, actually, no, it's not one whole shot. It's half of a shot because I cropped this about 50%. Here's the story. I'm walking down the street. I see a long line of people waiting for a store to open across from where I'm standing, and I notice the guy on the left starting to yawn. And I love taking pictures of people yawning. I just don't like people yawning during my presentations. So I knew very quickly to capture this yawn, I had to be quick. So I really didn't have any time to think. So I grabbed the picture. He was still yawning when I caught it. But I immediately knew afterwards that I was going to be cropping this shot by about 50%. Because parked on the road, right in front of these people, is a bright and shiny car. And this picture captured the top half of that car, which was very, very, um, I don't know, uh, distracting to the picture. So I cropped it by 50%. A lot of street photography is often spontaneous. Some street photography, you have a lot of time to take, but not always. I was on a beach and I saw this man just about to jump. I could tell by his body language. So almost immediately, I had to have my camera up and ready to get the shot. Very spontaneous. I was in India when these two boys suddenly ran past me. And again, very spontaneous shot. I didn't have time to capture this image. Uh, so I had to do, uh, I mean, it captured the image, but I didn't have much time to capture the image. Then there are photos like this one where you'd think you'd have a lot of time. This man's sitting there very quietly. I like the way he's in profile. I like where his arm is. It's a very, very quiet picture. But I knew I only had a few seconds longer to take this picture than I did of the person jumping or the kids running. Because at any time this man could move his arm down turn to the left or the right, he could get up and walk away, or someone or something could even walk into the picture. Here's another example where timing was everything. I saw the man reading a newspaper, and we know when you read a newspaper, you turn your head back and forth, or you turn the pages, so his position would be changing. But there is another urgent reason I had to take this picture quickly. The traffic in the background is heading his way, and right now, he's very clearly defined in the picture. Nothing is overlapping him, and he's not overlapping anything else. But give it a second or two, and his head would be overlapping the traffic. What is it that street photography does not have to have in it? But it often does. If I went up to a stranger who knew nothing about photography and asked them, what's a street photo? They could say, well, I guess it's a picture of a street or a picture taken on a street. And they'd be partly correct because it often is. If I went up to a different person who was a little more sophisticated and asked them, what's a street photo? They could probably say something like, well, it's a picture of a, a taken on a street in a big city, big urban area. And they'd be partly correct because it often is but it doesn't have to be. You can do street photography almost anywhere. You can be on a beach and do street photography in Antarctica. You can be on a ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and do street photography. And you can be in the Great Sahara Desert in the middle of nowhere, just outside of Timbuktu, and get street photography. So why is it that most of the famous street photographers through the history of street photography and most contemporary street photographers always seem to take pictures on streets and in big cities? 
they go where the fishing is good. That's why it seems they're always in big cities on streets. You don't have to. You can take street photography in the middle of a green field, but you're not going to get many pictures, and the odds are you're going to be waiting a long time. Take your camera to a small town. The odds are better, but you still may have to wait a while. But go to downtown Manhattan, Times Square. Suddenly you have thousands of people. You have all sorts of traffic, activities, signs, lights, colors, geometry, buildings. Your odds of getting a street photo there is much, much better. How about people? Do you have to have people in your street photography? If you've been paying attention, every picture I've shown you has had street photography, uh, has had people in my street photography. But you don't have to. There are other members of your family who are not people. I'm not talking about your uncle. I'm talking about your pets, your cats and dogs. And about five years ago, I discovered the joy of taking pictures of dogs. Now, the first several pictures you're going to see here are people with dogs because I also like to capture interaction. I like people with their pets. But you don't have to have people in the picture, as I said. Two dogs resting on a stairway and a little dog with a really nasty cat. You can have other animals in your street photos. Uh, I saw that both these horses were taken in Tibet, both these pictures. And the horse on the left I saw, I just thought, I'll never ever see this again. But in street photography, never ever say never ever because you never know. I saw the horse a couple hundred miles away on the right there a couple days later, and he was eating, uh, eating out of basketball. Other animals uh, can make for good street photography. Here's a cow resting on a beach, a cow wanting to hitch a ride. You can take pictures of sheep. Oh, uh, one thing, let me stop here for a second. I didn't mention this early, earlier. You notice the little L to the left of the picture? That means it's a local picture. You don't have to travel far, as I said. And so any picture that's uh, labeled with a little L means it's a local shot. Goats. Then there are animals we normally associate as only being in the wild or in the zoo. Animals like camels, llamas, and elephants. But in a lot of cultures around the world, those animals are important parts of people's lives. This is a working elephant in southern India. He's a holy elephant at a temple, and he's asking me for some money. So I gave him a couple rupees, and he handed it to his handler, the mahout, in the background there. And then the elephant approached me. But he wasn't approaching me to beat me up or to uh, wear at me. Instead, he was going to bless me, and he laid his trunk on my head and shoulders. One of my favorite type of uh, photographs are birds. It's going here. Not yet. Technical difficulty. One second, please. Here's a rooster on the way to work. I love taking pictures of seagulls and uh, pigeons. All you can find, both you can find in Cleveland. And this last picture of a pigeon, it seems like he's comparing his tail feathers to that of the peacock. Now, you don't have to have people or anything alive in your street photos. Often we have the idea of human activity, but the people aren't there. Sometimes we just have a picture that shows a relationship or an activity. In this photo, we know someone laid out the laundry and they'll be back later to pick it up. Here's the pot man going down the road. He's under there somewhere. Here's a relationship between an electric pole and an amusement park ride. Right? 
This is an advertisement inside of a bus stop. A piece of trash on the ground. I like taking pictures of statues, but again, there should be some sort of relationship or interaction. Here I juxt juxtaposed the Peace Memorial statue downtown with Abraham Lincoln's statue. They have stuck again out there. I also like taking pictures of mannequins to look at storefronts. Uh, the mannequin on the right seems to have fallen over and then maybe he fell in love. And in this picture, it looks like the large advertisement is peeking in at all the naked ladies. When you're out there, look for graffiti and street art. Now, a lot of graffiti is boring to somebody tagging their name or their gang sign on a wall. But sometimes graffiti, and especially street art, can say something about uh, modern life or the human condition. In this photo, you think somebody would use their cell phone to call the police. I was in Rome when I took these shots. Some very clever vandals had vandalized some of the do not enter signs. And this is one of my favorite combinations of graffiti with street art. I saw this painting. It was painted by Ben Slow, and I know that because he signed it at the bottom. And some critic came along and painted at the top that Ben Slow's art is average. And if you're going to insult an, av uh, an artist, call their work average. I like to think that Ben Slow figured out who did that and then painted Nat has herpes. When you're on the street, make sure you look for words. Sometimes the words don't fit the picture, and sometimes they do. Look for signs. Signs can be funny. Sometimes they can be strange or very truthful in this case. You never know where you're going to find uh, words. So look everywhere. This guy painted on the back of his shirt. It's a beautiful day to leave me alone. It's sort of ironic while he's riding a subway, but give way, skipping through the street in full swing. Again, you never know where you're going to find words. Sometimes the word is strong enough to stand out by itself. I saw the name of the store and I just had to take this picture. Other times, your word may need a little help, a little context. I saw the word reality, a nice script, but I thought the picture of just the word by itself wouldn't be enough. So I waited. I used time to my advantage until this woman wandered into the picture with her baby. And I think that's reality. Another example, I saw the sign, I think you should just go for it. I waited until I had some context. And in this last picture, I think it helps decide the old argument, who's better, Canon or Nikon? It must be Sony, even though we know it's Nikon. I said, you don't have to be on the street. You don't have to be in a big city. You don't even have to be outside. Take your camera inside for photography. One of my favorite places is museums. So I turn off my flash and I turn up my ISO.
And there are lots of places you can go inside. Go to the aquarium. To fancy restaurants. McDonald's. Go to a concert, but don't do this at Severance Hall. Inside of mosques. And in the public library. And if you're riding in a train or a bus or a um, subway, have your camera ready. Whether you're inside or out, look at windows, doorways, entryways for a picture. Called this three shots in the night. And this one's a shot in the light. Look for car uh, windows, uh, van windows, train windows, bus windows for potential pictures. And again, doorways and entryways. This last picture is my favorite entryway I've ever seen. It was an entry into a temple. The added ingredient. A lot of times, beginning street photographers come back with a lot of pictures that are actually pictorial. They're not particularly street photos. Here's an example of a pictorial shot. There's nothing really street about this, except that it's on a street. Uh, sometimes it comes down to the added ingredient, or that could be plural, a couple added ingredients that make a pictorial shot into a street photo, or can make an okay street photo into a much better one. This is not the original shot I took. I did doctor this picture a little bit. Here's the original shot. Now, suddenly, you may understand why I took the shot. It's not a great street photo, but it is considered a street photo. I have a picture of a bus next to a car and a bus that's next to a car in a picture. Uh, it's a boring picture of a bus, so I thought I'd show you this next one. So let's look at a couple pictures and see what the added ingredient is. People moving furniture would have been a street photo, but in this case, it's the posters on the fence that make it a better street photo. Four people on a motorcycle is a street photo. Let's see if this is going, maybe I didn't touch it. But the little boy's face makes it a better street photo. Three people on a uh, motorcycle is a street photo but it's the mystery of that lipstick kiss on the rear view mirror. Three men walking down the street in business suits with umbrellas. The added ingredient, they're all lifting their right foot at the same exact time. This picture obviously is a street photo by itself, but look at the face of the woman coming out of the store. Here's a wedding party going to a temple. Everybody in the party seems really happy, but look at the, uh, the face of the bride under that veil. She looks like she's on a death march. Here it's the busybody in the background who's butting in. 
I walked into a store in Nashville, Tennessee, and I took this shot of a kid jamming on a toy guitar. I didn't realize until I got it home later on and looked at it on my computer, I'd also taken the cover of a book in the background. And on the cover is this man who seems amazed by this little boy's tale. Sometimes street photography can say something about contemporary life. And this is a very 21st century photo. Something spectacular is happening above these people's heads. But wouldn't you know it, there's somebody with their face in the cell phone texting. Look at the woman on the far right. In this case, it's not so much an added ingredient as much as an added idea. I call this picture, it's Miller time, because if you drink too much beer, you're gonna have to use the porta potty I call this picture, it's Miller time, because the name on the porta potty is Miller. And I call this, it's Miller time, because the most common last name among the Ohio Amish happens to be Miller. So at least one of those women are a Miller. Okay, what do you need if you wanna start street photography? You need a camera that you're comfortable with, that you know how to use, that you can handle easily. Uh, you also need just about any kind of lens. Now, I would caution people who are starting street photography, don't buy a new camera, a new lens for six months at least. Save up your money. Several reasons why I'd recommend that. First of all, you don't know if you'd like street photography or not, so use your equipment. Don't invest in anything new yet. Second, uh, keep in mind that your camera, the one you're currently using, your lens, is probably 10 to 100 times better than anything that anyone used 50 years ago, and they were getting great shots 50 years ago. So you don't have an excuse. Also keep in mind that, like many other types of photography, the camera is only 10 or 15% of the actual photography. Most of it is what you do, how you take the picture, what you see. And keep in mind... Uh, you know, first of all, you have to uh, go out there. If you're not going out there, you're not getting any pictures. Second, you have to see the world around you. You have to concentrate on what's happening around you or you won't get any photos. Once you see something you want to take a picture of, then you have to learn to react spontaneously or quickly to be able to capture these images. And uh, the last thing you have to do is become comfortable being in strange places, taking pictures of people who are right next to you, uh, being surrounded by people. And for a lot of people, that's a, that's a turnoff. You will need a good pair of walking shoes. You need a lot of time, and you certainly need a lot of patience. Um, your success rate in street photography is very low. This is what I use. I have a Nikon D850. I saved up for at least a year to buy this. It is not a camera most street photographers would recommend. It's full frame, and that's a plus, but it's very heavy. I can carry it around for 12 hours. That's no problem. But to some people, they may not want to do that. And by the way, I don't carry it around my neck. It's in my hand at all times. Uh, it's also a large, conspicuous camera. And a lot of times, they say, oh, no, no, use something smaller. You don't want people to see your camera. It works for me. I use a telephoto lens. It's a Tamron, but it could have been a Nikon or some other brand. It's a, a 35 to 150 millimeter. The reason I like that is for the flexibility. I can literally take a picture of someone next to me and then a second later, someone across the street. If you use a telephoto lens, please don't make that a crutch. You don't want to depend on always taking pictures of people across the street. You want to be comfortable taking pictures of people next to you. I don't use a tripod, never carry it. I don't use a, a camera bag or a backpack. I never take a second camera or a second lens. I shoot with one lens, one camera. I always have extra batteries and photo cards with me because that's the worst thing to happen is run out of that uh, battery space or photo card space. I sometimes carry a cheap uh, shower cap with me because if it starts to rain or if I'm on a beach and the uh, sand starts blowing around, I can throw it on my camera for protection. My usual settings, I usually start with aperture priority. I like to control what's, what the depth of field is. I usually start with f-stop 8, but that can change. Even on bright sunny days, I'll shoot uh, with ISO 800 or even higher. 
I'm frequently going from bright sunlight to shadow to shade to sunlight again. I find a higher SIO helps. I shoot in the finest JPEG setting. I don't shoot in RAW. People have said, well, maybe you should shoot in RAW. Two reasons I don't. I spend a lot of time on the computer as it is, and if I shot in RAW, that's even more time converting to JPEG. And the second thing is I'm not shooting fine art. Not, uh, art. I know it's not like a um, studio portrait or a landscape where you would want to shoot in RAW, where the light and the color is so important. For these shots, I want to capture the movement, the emotion, the moment. So I'm not too worried about shooting in RAW. Couple techniques, and then I'll give you a lot more later on. First, go out alone. This is a solo activity. Even if your spouse or your best friend is a great street photographer, don't go out with them. You have to be alone so you have no distractions. Same reason you turn off your cell phone. When I first started this, I would plan to go downtown for a couple hours, and I'd get in my car and I'd be driving downtown, and I had all these preconceived ideas. Oh, I'm going to take pictures of people's faces and light and shadow and this and that and the other thing. And then I'd park the car and I'd start walking very quickly through the streets, always thinking that the, the next great picture is just around the corner, and it never was. So I've learned to relax. Instead of going out doing street photography, I consider this a long walk where I'm exploring, and I just happen to have my camera with me. I don't have any preconceived ideas. I have a blank slate, and that's very easy for me. Uh, blank uh, slate because I'm ready to capture almost anything. I'm open to find the next treasure, and I never know what that's going to be. And if you slowly walk with a sort of an uh, open mind, you're going to observe a lot more around you. Once you see a picture, make sure you shoot quickly, generally, and then keep on moving, generally. Sometimes I stay in the same spot for hours. Uh, because there's so much going around, uh, activity going around me. But generally, shoot quickly, keep moving. Try to blend in. Don't wear the tuxedo to the beach because you'll stand out too much. But don't hide either. Don't hide behind a bush or a wall or a tree or anything. Uh, try not to act nervous. Uh, if you're acting nervous or creepy, people will pick up on that, and that makes them very uncomfortable. If they're uncomfortable, they're going to be very suspicious of you. And if you're anything like me, and you enjoy as much as I do street photography, you're going to be smiling. Smile, smile, smile. And if you're wondering what this is, it's a dead shark that I saw on a, on a, a deck somewhere. If you're smiling, that puts people at ease. Okay, we're going to take a five-minute intermission. And I'm going to ring this bell at about the one-minute moment uh, mark so that you can come back. If you come back later or if you don't come back at all, that's fine. Uh, the second half is about as long as the first half. So thank you for coming. I'll see you in five minutes.
Okay. Welcome back uh, to the audience and anyone watching on YouTube. And I'll continue with the second half. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is the legality, the morality, or the ethics of street photography, which is often a problem people have. I just did that. Okay, is it legal? Is it ethical? Is it moral? I want to first state that I am not a lawyer. I didn't go to law school. I don't know much about the legality of street photography. I haven't done a huge amount of research, but I, knew, I do know some things. But take everything I'm about to say with a huge grain of salt. Also, keep in mind that laws change overnight sometimes, so what I say today may or may not be true tomorrow. Currently, in the United States and the United Kingdom, it is perfectly legal to take a photograph of anyone, and I can't think of an example of someone who couldn't be photographed, as long as they're in a public space. So if you're in a public park and someone else is in that park, you can take a picture of them legally, no problem. Uh, if you're in a private, if they're in a private space, but you're in a public spot and can easily see that person, you can also take their picture. So if I'm walking down a, pr a public uh, sidewalk or highway, and I see you on your front grass, on your porch, or standing in your front window, and I can easily see you from where I'm standing, I can legally take your picture. And the reason that law is the way it is, uh, is simply because uh, people should have no reasonable expectation of privacy. You're being photographed all the time and videotaped all the time. Uh, now, I, I sort of skipped this part. Keep in mind that some states, some cities, some countries may have specific laws, and you may want to look into that if you're going to Chicago or something, see if they have any special street laws. I've shot uh, street photography in at least 50 countries, and I've never had any problems. Uh, the reason the law is as it is, that you should have no reasonable expectation of privacy, is because if suddenly they change that law, banks, Walmart, city streets downtown, um, art museums would not be able to photograph you, and they're photographing you all the time. So that's why the law stands as it is. Now, once I take the picture, I do it for the joy of taking the picture most of the time. I also enjoy collecting these. I have a huge amount of photographs. You're going to see a lot of them tonight, unfortunately. Um, but I don't do much with uh, after I take them. I don't have Facebook. I don't have Instagram or anything like that. I show my friends occasionally. Uh, sometimes I enter them in the CPS competition, but that's about it. What I do know is that you cannot use your photos for commercial or po promotional purposes. You can't use your photos to sell a car or sell a coca-cola if you get a really great picture of someone drinking coca-cola you can't use that not unless you have a model release from that person or a model contract and here we're talking about an identifiable face you can hang your uh, photos in a gallery and you could even sell them because you also have the right of artistic expression if i'm selling a picture of you as an artistic shot that i took and street photography is under that genre of art artistic shots uh, or if I'm a photojournalist, I have the right of journalistic reportage. You can take those pictures and use them without permission from the, the person. Uh, think of all the history books, newspapers, news stories on TV, um, magazines that would be devoid of pictures if you had to get everyone who was in a picture in all those places to sign a model release. It's impossible. It's never been done. Couldn't be done. If you want to self-publish a book of your photos, that's great, and that's a great idea. That's something I'd eventually like to do. I wouldn't sell the book, but if you want to sell it, be very careful about who you use or what you use on the cover. If you have an identifiable person on the cover of a book, you may not want to uh, do that because a person could sue you because you're using it to promote the book or as a commercial. You know, the last romantic novel you bought, you bought it because of the cover, that sexy couple couple on the cover uh, making out. So that's what brought you to buy the book. And that could be argued why you buy 
my photo book if I had your picture on the front of it. Now, again, I just covered this briefly. I suggest you Google the latest information and make sure you read all the fine print. Now let's go to the next part, which I think is more questionable. Is it moral or ethical to take these photos, to take pictures of strangers on the street? I have two answers for you. The first answer is, it's up to you. We all have slightly differing senses of ethics or morality, and your high school ethics was certainly different than what you feel now. There are things you would have done in high school you'd never do now, and vice versa. So that's the first answer. It's up to you. Second answer is, is it moral or ethical? Yes, it is, because you're not doing anything wrong. If you're taking these pictures to slander, defame, or truly embarrass a person, you're doing something wrong. But if you're just doing street photography and not trying to defame someone, you're doing nothing wrong. Uh, three subjects that often come up when people ask about uh, the morality or the legality of it, uh, three subjects would be, first, police. Can you take pictures of the police? And the answer is, yes, you can. Just don't interfere with their job. You don't want to interfere with anyone's job. And uh, they have to be in public. You can't go into a private building and take pictures of police. Next question is, can you take pictures of people on the street? Is that okay? Well, again, legally, if they're in a public area, you can take their picture. Is it moral or ethical? The answer is, it's up to you. I take very few people of the, a uh, few pictures of the, uh, of people who are truly homeless or, or beggars. I do take some though. And usually I have a good reason to take it. This woman was begging on the street, but I don't have her face in the picture. And I took it because of the color and the repetition of the walls. In this photo, I, you can't see the man's face at all. So I thought it's okay to take this picture. Sometimes the homeless or street people have a great sense of humor. I saw this guy sitting there with a sign Homeless will fight your mother-in-law for spare change. And I don't think you can read the cup, but the cup says, it is our pleasure to serve you. I also didn't include his face. But sometimes I do include the face, but generally I have a feeling that it's usually going to be okay with the person. I saw this man in Vancouver. He was homeless, or at least he was on the street, and he used cardboard boxes to make a boat. On the side of the boat, it says the SS mag uh, money magnet. He's got a fishing pole and a rod and reel. And at the end of the line is a cup where he collects his tips. I took this picture without him knowing, but immediately afterwards, I walked up to him, showed him the picture. He loved it. We laughed, and I gave him a big tip. Now, I do take a lot of pictures of people on the street, but they're not homeless. These are people who are working or have... Uh, jobs they're working yeah uh often in tropical areas or sometimes in the heat of the summer you'll see people sleeping on the street they're just taking a siesta That was taken at the art museum. And then the big question, is it legal, moral, or ethical to take photos of children? Well, obviously, I take lots of pictures of kids because you're going to see them tonight. As far as legality, as long as you're not including frontal nudity, it is perfectly legal to take any photo of anybody in public, and that includes any age. So children are perfectly legal to take in public public. Is it moral or ethical? Again, this depends on you. I taught for more than 30 years. I worked with students who were aged 4 to 24. So I, I love working with kids. Kids wear their emotions on their sleeves. Uh, they're unpredictable. You never know, like this case, what's going to happen next. You did wake up the dog. 
Uh, and people then also ask, what about the parents or other adults? Do you take these pictures when the parents are there? I will literally be standing next to the parent. I don't ask them permission, but the kid is doing something either unusual or funny. And the parent sees me taking the picture. And they either don't say anything to me, or if they do, it's usually something very positive. Like, oh, he's, he does that all the time. This little girl who's bawling her eyes out was in the middle of a marketplace in Burma. And I saw her crying, went up to her, took a few pictures. The mother is literally sitting two feet away. And the mother was laughing the whole time as I was taking sh uh, shots. In this next shot, the father never knew I took the picture, but I had to take it. He was walking around for several minutes holding up his daughter like that. Little girl knew I took the shot. So again, this is up to you. If you feel uncomfortable taking pictures of uh, children, don't take them. Uh, by the way, generally women feel a little more comfortable about this than men. Probably the two most interesting types of people to take pictures of, kids under 10, adults over 65. Uh, someone is passing out pencils for this picture and there's a bit of a riot. This little girl had discovered a rainbow. We'll see that rainbow later on, I think. Okay, so we're going to go out and take some shots. What are the very basic things you take pictures of? The first four S's will cover some of that. First thing you're going to look for is a subject. And a subject does not have to be a person. It could be a thing or an animal, anything you want. But it has to be someone or something that's interesting. If you don't find it interesting, you're not going to get many good shots. They should fill most of the frame up. Try to have your background as simple as possible. Don't have a lot of clutter in your picture. And this is why I shoot an aperture, because I can sort of blur out that background. Now, a subject doesn't necessarily mean a single person or thing. You could be taking groups. That could be your subject. The next S is scene. Uh, to do street, scenic street photography, you, you don't necessarily have to have a subject. You may have a subject or two in it, but they play a minor part. You want to fill up your picture as much as possible with what's in the scene. Uh, you want to pay attention especially to the foreground, the uh, middle ground, the background. And again, be careful that you're not taking a scenic shot that's not a street photo. In this shot, if you remove the man from the wall, it's a pictorial shot. It's not a, a street photo anymore. Again, you don't always have to have people in it, but uh, sometimes you do. Look for interesting backgrounds. Here I have a subject, but he's very, very tiny. It's a man sitting on a chair reading a newspaper. He's surrounded by the scene. Here I filled up my scene with light and shadow, with lines, color, and texture. I walked behind this metal stair stairway going up from the beach, and I created a scene by using a man just behind the stairway. And in this picture, I used the shadows of the poles to help fill up the scene. Next S is situation. Situational pictures are probably my favorite type of street photography. They're probably the most difficult to capture because you don't you usually see a lot of subjects, usually scenes, but situations not every day. So 
look for situations, something happening. These tend to be the best pictures that tell stories. Sometimes the situation's real simple. Two guys playing chess, three people looking at an unusual moth, two guys looking at something else, uh, the junior high girls making fun of the boys, telling the salesman no thanks. Sometimes the situation's a little more uh, serious. Every morning I'd eat at an outside cafe in Lithuania, and every morning this man, who I later found out was not homeless, he was not asking for money or looking for money, in his retirement he loved to sing, and he would appear on the corner of the street near the cafe and just sing religious and patriotic songs. One day, two Russian thugs, and I found out they were Russian later on, came up to him, and for some reason they're threatening him. Eventually, one of the thugs punched the man in the stomach and he fell over. The thugs ran away. Several people, including myself, got up to help him. But by the time I was there, somebody on the street had already helped the man up. And here he's consoling the old man. This picture was taken in Paris. Two Romani young ladies, or gypsies, came up to this tourist couple and they were either going to scam them or pickpocket them but the tourists caught on. And in this picture, a, a sudden cry went up in a marketplace in Ethiopia. Some thief had stolen someone's money and it came right, uh, the thief ran right by me. He was quickly surrounded by people and the man in the pink shirt grabbed the thief and the man still, the thief is still uh, clutching the money in his hand. To take this shot, by the way, I had to raise my camera way over my head because there were several people in front of me and I took the shot blind. Then there are situations that you may misread. This looks like some bully is picking on some guy, but that's not what this is about. The woman who looks a little concerned is actually doing Tai Chi. The man in the middle is a Tai Chi instructor. He's putting pressure on the other man while the man is trying to balance and learn to keep balance. Look at the man on the right's feet. He's on his heels trying to balance. So you don't find great subjects, great scenes, or great situations. That doesn't mean you go out and don't take pictures. Whenever you go out, take at least one or two shots. If for no other reason, practice composition, how the light can be captured, whatever it is. Here's a very, very simple thing. Look for simple things. A man standing next to a rope. Someone combing their hair. Someone looking in a window. These are shots you may have missed because they're too simple. Man getting a, a blanket out of his trunk. Someone reading a book. working at the airport, waiting to cross the street, and holding a coffee cup, maybe not in the usual way. The four S's lead us to the four F's, and the first three of the F's are techniques that you can try. The first one's very simple. It's what most street photographers do. They simply hit the streets, and they find the next picture. Once you find a picture, and again, be open-minded about this. You never know what you're going to uh, capture. Just make sure you capture in time. That was at Edgewater Park. The next F is a little more complicated. It's called fishing. So you're walking somewhere and you suddenly see this great scene in front of you. The only problem is if you took a picture of that scene, it would be a pictorial shot. It wouldn't be a street photo. You want to make it into a street photo. You can't ask anyone to come in the picture. 
but you can wait until they do it on their own. That's called fishing. I saw this umbrella stuck in the puddle on the beach, and I thought it'd be a pretty bland picture. It still is sort of a bland picture, but I made it into a street photo by simply waiting till someone walked by. This would have been architectural photo, except I waited until people entered it. Sometimes it doesn't matter who walks into your picture. It could be a man, woman, child, a cat or a dog, somebody on a bicycle. Some, uh, same for this next picture, too. It could have been anybody who walked in the picture that would have completed it. But sometimes you're a little pickier. I saw this very colorful mural of Carmen Miranda, and I knew I couldn't just have somebody in gray clothing walk in. So I waited until someone who had some color in them walked by. This woman has a red scarf, lavender jacket, and very pink pants. In this case, you immediately see the eyes and then the yellow paint. I needed someone with strong body language and with some bright color. Now she's dressed in black, but at least her body language is interesting and she has a bright red bag. Sometimes you see a scene you really like, and I spotted this shadow of a palm tree on this ancient wall in Morocco. And I waited, and this man came into the picture, and I was very happy with this shot. And before I left, I thought, mm, you know, maybe I'll stick around, see if I can get another shot with the same scene. And I got at least a couple more good shots, changing the, the feeling of the picture. Sometimes the body language of who walks in your picture is important. This is taken in front of the old Higby building near Christmas a couple years ago, and they had the wings on the inside of the window at uh, the casino. And I took several pictures of people walking by. This is my favorite because the man is turning his head. He's full stepping. There's some action in the picture. He's moving his arms around. In this photo, the man looks like he's sneaking around. He wasn't, but for some reason, I just captured him as if he's looking like he's doing something illegal. This woman, bless her soul, was walking by, just turned and uh, to the left, just at the right time. I have no idea what she was looking at. And this next picture, the man was looking at a construction site on a building across the street, but it looks like he's looking up at the giants. I like to use props in my photos. Uh, if someone has an umbrella or a dog, it often makes the picture a little bit better. Sometimes we get really fortunate with these pictures. I like the pattern of the pavement. I like the poles, the dark tree. I was waiting for someone to walk in, and this guy drops his water bottle just at the right place. This next picture doesn't look like it's fishing, but it actually was. I walked by a, uh, a bus stop in Japan, and I saw nobody there. Nobody was sitting there. But I noticed somebody had stuck a word balloon or a thought balloon on the side of the wall. And I just thought, gee, if I only had someone sitting there. But I wasn't going to wait around. I wanted to get to a museum or a temple or something. So I, I walked, continued walking. About an hour and a half later, I came back just to see if there was anybody at the bus stop. And here's this guy sitting in the exact right position. I was about to take his picture. He had no idea I took this photo when he started to fidget around, he was moving. And I thought, oh, I better wait until he stops fidgeting around. He was getting his cell phone out of his pocket. He lifts his glasses over his eyes, and then he starts to yawn. And that's the moment I got the shot. 
In this photo, I couldn't have asked for a better subject to walk in. I was across the street, and there was a restaurant with this large crescent of balloons in front of it, the red, white, and black balloons. I saw two people standing under the balloons. One was a man who's in the picture there somewhere. He's sort of covered by the clown. And the other was this woman, and her coloring matched the balloons. Pale, light skin, dark hair, and a red suit. So I was about to take that, and I thought, no, I'm going to wait. And there were several people who walked into this picture. It just didn't fit it. And suddenly, from around the corner, on the side of the street where the restaurant was, comes some clown with a buttload of balloons. And I'm hoping the whole time he'll walk past this restaurant. He could have turned around. He could have crossed the street. But he kept on walking. So that's the shot I got. And the added ingredient for me is that the woman who hit was pretty much expressionless up until the clown arrived is now beaming. He must have said something funny to her. And then there's something I call reverse fishing. So instead of waiting for someone to come into your picture, you're waiting for them to leave. I was in Costa Rica and I saw this large mural. I was across the street at the time and the man was sleeping under it. And it, it looks like he's having a dream, a wild dream. The only problem was there were people continuously walking by him. Another problem was I was across the street and there were cars and buses and trucks continuously going by me, blocking the scene. So it took me about 15 minutes to get this shot until nobody was in the picture. If you're doing fishing, consider the walking triangle. The walking triangle is when people's feet are furthest apart when they move, and it causes a triangle. This adds some interesting movement to your picture, shows action. It can also add triangles. And if you can add triangles or circles or squares to a picture, that's usually a good thing. It can also create a, a feeling of stability. If someone's carrying something, Often that triangle adds a little stability to your shot. Next step is following. Now, I don't do a lot of following. I never did, but I do even less now that I'm older. Following, following is where you are, are standing on the street and you're looking in this direction, but from some other direction, someone walks by or something goes by, which would have been a great shot. And by the time you notice it, it's too late. They usually give up. But occasionally, in this case, in the picture next, I thought I'd go for it. This guy walked right by me. I didn't notice him at first. He was already several feet ahead of me. There were people in between him and myself. But I thought I'd follow him. So I went about two blocks with him. Never got a good picture because there were always people in between us. He turned left into a large open plaza. The people disappeared, and I got this shot. And the same thing for this next picture. Both these were taken in, in Dublin, Ireland. This man walks right by me. I had no idea that he was there when I when he walked by. I turned around because I thought I saw him holding something, and I saw he was holding this large yes sign. He was walking very fast. It took me a while to catch up. He finally stopped at a crosswalk, gave me time to get up to him. As he's crossing, I took several pictures. He must have heard my shutter go off, and that's the picture I got. And the last F is failure. It doesn't matter if you're trying to dance or cook or learn to read or do anything. You're going to have to deal with failure. And with street photography, there's a lot of failure involved. You're going to miss so many pictures. Failure is only failure if you fail to learn something from it. It's good to fail because it helps us grow. It propels us forward to try different things. Uh, Alex Webb is a very famous street photographer. He's photographed for more than 40 years. He's published over 30 books. And his quote is, street photography is 90%, 99% failure. And he's a world famous photographer. Still has trouble with it. Now, usually the failure is on my part. I didn't have the camera set right. I missed taking the picture. I, I was too slow. Something went wrong. And it was my problem. But sometimes someone walks right in front of you when you're taking a photo. And that's called a photo bomber. I used to hate photo bombers because they ruined so many of my pictures. But now I sort of love photo bombers because they can make a picture a little more interesting. 
I was originally going to take a picture of this young lady on the bike. She's looking at her cell phone. And just as I took it, I was photobombed from both sides. The guy on the left walks in looking at his cell phone. And the woman in the back, top part of the uh, back uh, right side, is looking at her cell, cell phone too. So this adds depth to the picture, which wouldn't have been there. And it adds a little more interest. Plus, there's sort of a line you could draw across the three faces. This next picture was taken in Paris. A waiter was having a cigarette break next to this uh, unusual looking mural. I took the shot and just as I took it, this woman walks in the picture. And amazingly, she's smoking a cigarette and her hand, cigarette, lips, and cheeks are almost identical to the waiter's. I was in Morocco. And originally, I was going to take a picture of the checkerboard wall, the red and white wall. And the man was going to be on the far left. And he was standing there in profile. He was looking off to the side. When suddenly, I, I felt this movement to my left. So I quickly moved my camera over, thinking it was a photobomber. And I was right. This kid was going to write, walk right into my picture. He was eating a sandwich. The man, who must have been following the boy with his eyes, suddenly looked up. The kid looked up, and I got this shot. And it's not always people who photobomb you. I've been photobombed by cars and other things. I didn't realize until after I got this home that I'd been photobombed. If you want to try something different, shoot from the hip or from your lap. Uh, this is something I'm not very good at. I tend to cut a lot of heads off. I tend to take a lot of pictures of sidewalks, plain old sidewalks, or people's feet. Uh, and I don't want their feet in that case. But it's a good thing to try out. A lot of times uh, I'm shooting from my lap. The first two pictures you're going to see are from my lap. I was in an Israeli train station. This soldier comes up, looks at his cell phone. I'm sitting at a bench. I was either too nervous or too scared or maybe too lazy to raise the camera uh, up to my face. So... I thought, I'll go for it. I'll try it for my lap. And I did capture his image. And by the way, there was a lot of noise in the train stations, so he never heard my shutter go off. This next picture is a lazy picture. I was sitting on the bench. This kid comes running by doing karate moves, and I just took my chance. The next three pictures are hip shots. And sometimes with a hip shot, I actually stop for a second to take the picture, but sometimes I continue walking. And I hope it doesn't blur. Here are two places you don't put your finger during COVID. Juxtaposition. Juxtaposition is where you take two or more objects, people, images, whatever they are, and you place them one in front of the other or possibly next to each other. You're trying to create a relationship, uh, interest in a picture, maybe layering, uh, and often you're creating an opposite feeling. You're looking at two things that are not quite fitting together. I took this photo of a large advertisement in the airport, the man walking by, and the uh, shadow of the grill above, juxtaposed. Here I have the sense of old age and relaxing, and young age running around. Something exciting in the back room, uh, background and something not so exciting in the foreground. Happy and not so happy. Maybe lost youth or second childhood. In this case, I juxtaposed uh, the man going down the escalator, the flowering plant, and what's almost a silhouette of the window washer. I was going up an escalator when I took this picture. This man was coming down, and before he got to it, I noticed a large advertisement for a boy singing group who were performing in Korea at the time. So I timed it so this guy would be in the picture. But wouldn't you know it, just as I took the picture, he started to yawn. 
Looks like he's trying out for the group. You never know what you can juxtapose with each other. In this photo, it looks like the ninja warrior is starting, trying to stop the drug dealer from making a delivery, but the ninja warrior was just doing Tai Chi and the drug dealer was not delivering Coke, he was delivering Coca-Cola. And for this picture, I closed up my aperture to its highest f-stop to try to get everything in focus. I saw pigeons on a wall and just beyond the wall were people at the beach. Uh, the added ingredient, by the way, is the man looking up in the air as if to wonder if more birds were gonna arrive. Wait for it, the decisive moment. Henri Cartier-Bresson is considered the father of street photography, and he coined the phrase, the decisive moment. It's the moment that the picture can best be taken, and that's usually with an action shot. You missed the boy flying earlier, but uh, a second before the boy was flying, he was on the ground. A second after, he was also on the ground. This man would be in the water in a second or two, so this is the best time to get a picture. Not all photography has a decisive moment, but a lot of street photography does. In this picture, the decisive moment is just before the man bites into the sandwich, the man who's sitting down, the bass player. The decisive moment in this picture Looks like the girl is reaching for the package. She's not, she's just walking by. Both these hula hoops were moving a lot when I took this picture. So again, down to the decisive moment. Just when she walked between the bikes, just when things seemed to line up on the beach, just the moment when he discovered his pants fell down. And just the moment the surfer lost control and is plunging straight down into the water. For this picture, you think the decisive moment is the ball being where it is, just as he's about to hit it. But there's a little bit more to this. Not only did I have to have the ball in that position and his body language like that, but a breeze had to blow the um, sari, which was hanging on the clothesline, away from him because it was covering the top half of his body. He did uh, hit several uh, balls into the, the outfield there. That's the Ganges River. And I did get another shot a couple of minutes later, which is a decisive moment. The kid on the right is so sure he's going to catch the ball before it's intercepted. And in this shot, the decisive moment, fishing, and uh, juxtaposition come together to form one shot. That was a large advertisement on the side of the wall. Look for color, light, shadows, and silhouettes. Sometimes the picture is only about the color. Sometimes it's only about one color. Sometimes you have a lot of color in your pictures, but some of the colors may be muted. Sometimes a little brighter and sometimes very vivid. There is a rainbow out there, you just have to find it. And to color, look at the light source or look at how color is affected by light. This was taken at Public Square a couple winters ago when they had the ice rink. And they had a spotlight which created this 
weird light whenever people got into it. This was taken on a CPS field trip uh, several years ago uh, when they had the summer solstice shots at the Cuyahoga River. Most people had left, but this guy stuck around. It could be somebody in this room. Here the morning light is streaming through the flags and the balloons. This was a very, very lucky shot. I don't think this happens very often. I had no idea it was going to happen. In Hong Kong, at certain times of the year, certain times of the day, the light must stream through the glass awning of a hotel, creating a prism, which then makes rainbows. Look for your light source. It could be a window or a door. Could be a shaft of light coming through um, tall buildings. This is taken at Playhouse Square. The woman didn't know I took her picture. She's talking on her uh, Bluetooth. In this case, you'd think the sunlight lit up the man, and you'd only be partly correct because the sun is actually behind him. He was parked or stopped in front of a truck, and the light reflecting off the truck lit him up. And in this case, there was a large hole in the ceiling, an oculus. To light and color add shadow, practice taking shadow pictures. Best time is usually in the morning or late in the day, sometimes at night if you have a strong light source. And also look uh, to create uh, silhouettes. If you have a really strong background of light, or if you're shooting into the sun, think about creating uh, silhouettes. Be careful with your eyes and your uh, camera sensor because they can be damaged by strong sunlight. Sometimes silhouettes look better in black and white. That was taken at the Terminal Tower one Christmas. Look for reflections, mirrors, and glass. If it's been raining out, look for uh, puddles on the ground. Look at motorcycle mirrors. This is not done in Photoshop. This is the way I took the photo. Uh, this is probably the shiniest building in London, England. This man was leaning against it, and I simply took the picture. Same type of shot done in, London, uh, in New York City. Here, the man's reflection as he's walking by a storefront created this picture. And in this shot, the Triceratops was in the room with me. I noticed his reflection on the inside of the glass. I simply got a picture of his reflection with what was outside the glass. Look for repetition and mimicry in your picture. People like to see patterns. And if you can capture a pattern, that's usually a good thing. and look for mimicry. Mimicry is where something seems to be copying something else.
This was taken on Euclid Avenue. It started to rain. The woman put her jacket over her head. Now we have four headless people. Everybody's looking up in this photo, including the paintings. Rich duck, poor man. Elbows up, whether you're relaxing or working. And in this picture, I like to think of it as these young women have stepped in the 21st century from their traditional past. Be aware of body language, gesture, expression. You know, I like taking pictures of people's hands. See if the hands are doing anything. and look for people's body language, how they're holding their body, how they're standing. These two Vietnamese soldiers were on a bike. The one in the back is pedaling, the one in the front is steering. And these are a few of my ostrich pictures. If you want to capture emotion or feeling in your pictures, look at people's expressions. If you take these pictures, by the way, try not to let them know you're taking them because you don't want to interrupt uh, their expression. You don't want them to turn to you and put on that photographic smile. Look for the lovers. Sometimes love is blind. This kid's getting an education. And then if you can add action or movement, look also at sports for your pictures. Sometimes when you take a moving shot and you want action, you can blur out the moving figure or sometimes do the opposite, have them tack sharp and blur out the background. Usually when I take a moving shot, uh, I try to freeze everything. The most common movement would be walking, then running. Sometimes you see people jumping. This is a uh, class in a field trip in Spain. They were all jumping.
Sometimes people are trying to avoid something like getting wet or getting hit by the ball. And I find people dancing on the street all the time. They're not professionals. They're not doing it for money. They're doing it for fun. Someone brings a boom box or maybe some other source of music and people just start dancing. And look for gymnastics and sports, but don't go to the gym, don't go to the arena or the stadium for this. These are people having fun or just practicing outside. Look for surfers at the beach. For cricket players, you're not gonna find a lot in Cleveland, but basketball players. soccer players, football players, foosball players. And you can always find someone on a skateboard. Or maybe on a scooter. Or on a bicycle. If you're shy about taking photos of people, look for street performers. Uh, they're happy to have their picture taken. Usually they encourage it. If their act is good, make sure you give them a tip. Uh, unfortunately, in Cleveland, Cleveland area, unless there's a special festival or fair or something, we don't see a lot of street performers. So you may have to go somewhere else to get these shots. And go to events. If you're, at an, if you're at, at an event, chances are someone else will have cameras too. So take all the pictures you need to. It could be a, a memorial service, speech by the president of Lithuania, a drunken bachelor party that spills out into the street could be beauty school graduates who are displaying their talents, a bar mitzvah parade, the 70th anniversary of the founding of Israel. Could be an air show, but don't just take pictures of the airplanes up close. Could be a fall festival in Japan or a spring festival in India. And by the time I took these pictures, I was completely covered with paint. Go to protests and demonstrations, but be, be very careful because, uh, you know, sometimes they can become violent or other problems. This is a protest against Iran that was taking place in Germany. Protest in Madrid. Go to a good old American parade. And a not so good American parade. This is the parade they held for the Browns after a perfect season. Zero wins. Go to a running marathon a bicycle marathon, an eating marathon in Little Italy during Feast of the Assumption, hamburger eating competition in Akron, the international yo-yo competition in Cleveland, parade the circle, Day of the Dead, which is held on Detroit Road in Cleveland. 
and go to one of our many county fairs. A lot of pictures you can take in county fairs. This was a donut eating contest, and the kid on the left won. And just an hour drive south of us is the rodeo in Burbank, Ohio, that's held every summer, several months during the summer. But don't just take pictures of what's happening in the arena. Turn your camera to the crowd. This Amish man was getting his licks in before his ice cream melted. It was a very hot day. And I have no idea what's happening in this next picture, except that the crowd really loved it. I'm almost done. Have a project or a theme in mind. If you've been shooting for at least a year and you don't realize you already have themes, look back at your pictures, go through them, and you may find, oh, I tend to take this subject or this type of picture. Gather those together, and then you have something to build a project on. You could create a, a book, like a coffee table book if you wanted. Uh, by the way, if you didn't know what my theme here is, it's people at work. Uh, you could create a book or possibly even a gallery showing based on that theme. I often have more than one theme also. That was the Natural History Museum. This woman was working really hard. She put even more bricks on her head. These guys aren't working that hard. And this last guy's not working at all. Now, like I said, you can have more than one theme going on. You probably should. One of my themes, which is completely different, is umbrellas. I like the color, the shapes of umbrellas. Again, they make nice props for photos, for street photos. It's also a reason why it gets me out in the rain to shoot shots. If I fly into a city and it's going to rain all week, it doesn't bother me. And the last theme I'm going to show you is a theme I wasn't aware of. I knew I took a lot of kids' pictures, but until recently when I was getting ready for this presentation, I didn't realize how many pictures I had of kids interacting with their parents. This was taken at the art museum. And this one at Edgewater Park. And this is my last photo. I want to thank you for attending, for watching, if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, one last word of advice. If you want to do street photography, it's very important that you be there and you be aware. Thank you. Well, I might add, are there any questions or comments? Okay, thank you. How many, how, how many acceptable photos do I have? Because I, I have mi millions of photos, but I probably have 30,000 that I consider acceptable. Oh, in this presentation, about 550 maybe. Yeah, it probably seemed like a lot more, I know. Okay.
Do I take multiple shots uh, or put it on burst mode? It depends. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do I take multiple shots? In some cases, I do. If it's an action shot, like when I showed you the man coming out of the water at the beginning, I took three very quick shots in a row because sometimes you need to do that, especially when you can tell someone's going to be flying or moving across the screen. But um, for some of the pictures, I just time it right. I take one shot. Uh, of those hip shots, those lap shots were just, you know, I take one shot and I hope for the best. Any other questions? Thank you. Yes. Yes. In fact, if you do this, do I, she asked, do I have uh, an idea of what picture I take before I actually take it? Yeah. Yeah. Do I, do I have a feeling before I take the picture that's going to happen? And yes, you, when you do this enough, you start to read body language and you can start to predict. I was in uh, Sophia Budapest for a couple days and I could predict when people were going to kiss. I don't know why. And they weren't holding hands or anything, but I just knew I got to get this picture. They're about to kiss. Uh, so yeah, sometimes uh, that's why you have to go out alone. Uh, you don't want any distractions because you do sort of build up almost a psychic uh, sense of what's going to happen. Yeah. Oh, right. It's not always that I discover it post production on the computer. Sometimes I, I know immediately, although it will happen. I, I, I think I got a great picture and then I do look at my computer and I realize something's really wrong with it. It's just not good enough. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Special, our special thanks to John Theobald for uh, this evening. And if you'd like to view the presentation again, visit the CPS YouTube channel. The link is available on the CPS homepage or simply visit YouTube and search for Cleveland Photographic. And also please send us your feedback at info at clevelandphoto.org. Thank you very, uh, very much and good evening. <laughs>